everyone, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, so, who am I and what is Vertcoin? Well, I'm an undergraduate researcher here at MIT at the Digital Currency Initiative. I'm the lead developer of Vertcoin, uh, which I've been for three years now. Uh, Vertcoin is a coin that launched in January 2014 and was forked from Litecoin's code base uh, without any ICO, airdrop, or pre mine. Uh, so, we're currently a non profit uh, trying to perpetuate Vertcoin's adoption amongst the wider community. Our primary goal is to uh, use mining algorithm design and blockchain governance in order to prevent ASICs from being used on our network. Uh, we believe that distributing mining rewards and transaction fees to the vast majority of people is one of the most important goals of cryptocurrency. Uh, and it kind of sucks that Litecoin and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, make it so that's no longer really possible. It's cut off quite a large uh, adoption method, I think. Uh, and we've actually previously hard forked to Lyra2RE, which is an algorithm we created from Scriptan uh, when ASICs for Scriptan were released in 2015. So we've set quite a decent precedent, which I think would deter any future ASIC from being created for Vertcoin. Um, so this talk is about Lightning and the work we've been doing on it. And one of the biggest problems we found is people actually know very little about Lightning and how it works. Uh, so I, the biggest things people don't know about Lightning would be that it's interactive. Uh, people don't realize that you have to be online to send and receive payments. Uh, and if you or others don't defend your channel, i.e. pay attention to the blockchain, uh, see if old transaction uh, channel states have been broadcast, then you, you can lose money. And you know, when you make channels with people, you ultimately link your IP address to on-chain funds, which is kind of bad because if you have a bunch of Bitcoins and suddenly I can figure out where you live, then you're liable for real-world theft. So, you know, what are your options given these you know, challenges? So you can just give all your money to Coinbase and have them do it for you. Uh, I, I really don't like this option. I think it kind of defeats the point. Uh, you can rent a VPS and put all your money and your Lightning Network node on that, which would work, uh, and you have some control over it, but ultimately the hardware is owned by someone else. So you have very little scope for recompense if something goes wrong. Or, and, and this is my favorite and preferred option, you can be self-sufficient and run the software reliably for yourself. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, there are quite a lot of requirements to be self-sufficient. You need reliable hardware that stays up all the time to allow you to receive funds and to defend your channel. Um, you really should run full nodes for every coin you want to transact with so that you're not trusting anyone uh, for accurate blockchain data. And ultimately, you know, opening channels with other nodes really shouldn't dox you and reveal who you are and where you live so that your private keys cannot be physically stolen. And, and you, know, you need to understand security best practices to ensure that your private keys, which ultimately will be always connected to the internet, don't get stolen. Uh, hardware wallets are fundamentally incompatible with Lightning because it would be unrealistic to accept, expect someone when they want to receive money to go and connect their hardware wallet to their Lightning device uh, and authorize a receiving payment. Uh, that won't work in practice. But you know, unfortunately, there's reality, and the reality is most users keep their coins in exchanges. Uh, so, and they turn their computers off when they stop using them. I found this quite surprising. I don't think I've ever turned my computer off deliberately, but people do this. And the interactive, interactivity requirement for LN you know, precludes mobile devices from being LN nodes. Uh, people assume that they're going to have you know, lightning on their phone, but the reality is, is that's unlikely to happen without some kind of external device or hosting. And you know, most people are just never going to do this for themselves. Uh, we can't expect people to run complex software systems and understand security and networking and things like that. So we came up with this idea called Litbox. Uh, and it's essentially a small plug and pay hardware device, uh, likely ARM based, so a Raspberry Pi type thing, sold you know, at cost pretty much. Uh, that just takes care of all of these complexities for you. Uh, and the device connects to your wireless router, uh, probably via Ethernet, and stays online, uh, which allows you to have remote access to your funds uh, from any device. And you know, as part of this, we'll provide companion mobile and desktop thin clients to allow you to remote control it. So what's in the box? Ultimately, it's a series of Docker containers that provide uh, pruned full nodes for Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Vertcoin. Uh, it has Lit, which is the DCI's Lightning implementation, and a browser-based administration interface, so you can pair new devices to your Litbox. 
Uh, it has Tor encapsulation so that you don't reveal your physical location whenever you connect to other nodes and open and close channels. And an SSH tunnel so that you can have authenticated remote control securely from any device that you might want to use when you're out and about. Uh, there are some really cool actual implications of this. Users can actually be their own bank. Uh, they can share their wallets across all their devices and keep their actual private keys in one place uh, without having to really interact with the network itself or configuration. And it provides a potentially really large increase in privacy for users and protection from user error. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have right now is all of the altcoins have overlapping address formats. Uh, especially when it comes to pay to script hash. This is a serious problem because people send different coins to addresses from the wrong coin. And then it comes down to exchanges to try and figure out what to do with that money and how to give it back to the user. So with this, we could ultimately deprecate on-chain addresses in favor of uh, LN1 prefixed BEC32 addresses and a payment protocol. So what this means is that you, you, know, you can send and receive any Bitcoin protocol-based coin using a single coin agnostic Lightning Network address per user, which is ultimately going to simplify things for a lot of people. It will be more like having an account number on your bank than having different addresses per user. Uh, the advantage of this is by using a payment protocol, we can abstract away from you know, on-chain addresses completely and just have these Lightning Network addresses. You know, this means that people will automatically be using a new address for every transaction that they make, which adds quite a lot of privacy properties. When coupled with Tor, I think it will be very hard to de-anonymize users on this network. Uh, how can we make this real? Most of the back end is actually already completed. Uh, the GitHub link is on there. You can check it out and spin it up for yourself. Um, the thin clients are still in the design phase. We're working on trying to get the UX really correct because until you actually start putting this stuff in the hands of users, you don't realize how little they actually understand about how it works and how much you have to abstract away from them because they're used to just using their credit card in a store and they don't have to really interact with any technology at all. And we're aiming for a minimum viable product by the end of the second quarter of this year. So yeah, if you have questions, you can email me uh, or contact me on the Twitter and there's our website. Uh, I'll also take questions now if anyone has any. Oh, I mean, internally, it's just going to be an ARM-based device. Uh, Raspberry Pi is actually kind of overkill because it has Bluetooth and audio and wireless and other things you don't need. And um, we'd really like to get the cost of devi the device under like $30 if we can, uh, because if it's too expensive, people simply won't buy it, and then you'll have poor adoption. Um, so right now, yes, we are just using a Raspberry Pi. But again, your average user is not going to put a Raspberry Pi in their house. They'll say that looks ugly. And Apple is particularly successful because they have good design. So I see no reason why this shouldn't be the same. How can you get enough storage in a $30 place for all your blockchains? Uh, well, you can't. Um, that's why we use prune nodes. So with prune nodes, you, you can fit it on you know, a 32 gig or 64 gig micro SD card. Uh, we're thinking about maybe as an extension providing a uh, hard drive based devices, so you could run a full full node with, with history. Um, but I mean, that's a future thing, and it's not 100% necessary for security purposes. Uh, additionally, you can see how this could be easily extended to include some kind of point of sale terminal so that you can you know, use it in stores and things like that. Cool. Thanks, everyone. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay. I'm a developer at Zcash Co., which is the company responsible for maintaining the Zcash network. And I joined two years ago in 2016 when I met Zuko, the CEO, at a decentralized web conference. So I'm going to go over sort of the basics of what Zcash is and how it works, and then give an update on what's happened since we've launched and what's exciting coming up in the next year. So Zcash is similar in some ways to Bitcoin. It is issued with the same reward and supply schedule, so it has the same monetary supply, um, block reward,
but it has some key differences. So, of course, the biggest one is the shielded transactions, but in addition, we changed the proof of work from Bitcoins to Equihash, which is memory intensive and more ASIC resistant. And then we changed the block interval to 2.5 minutes, raised the block size to two megabytes. And the development of Zcash is funded through a percentage of each block reward for the first four years. And so this was a somewhat different funding mechanism when we created Zcash, um, very different from like the ICOs or pre-mines. Um, so it's kind of like a built-in um, incentive to uh, help fund and build out the network. And so, of course, the biggest thing that Zcash adds is the creation of private or shielded transactions. And so, with the private transactions, coin can be made invisible um, and stored on the blockchain in encrypted form. And then the use of a ZK snark, which is a kind of zero-knowledge proof, proves that these encrypted transactions are valid. And so, Zcash's goal is to put privacy in the hands of users. And to this end, we're moving towards eventually having a completely shielded ecosystem but for now we have transparent as well as shielded addresses and we're creating various levels of transaction privacy on those encrypted transactions. So here's a picture of a Zcash transaction to kind of illustrate the flow of value through the Zcash ecosystem. So the green is the transparent. You have these transparent addresses and value can flow out of those into the shielded addresses, which is your private protected value. And you can have inputs in any combination of um, transparent to shielded, shielded to transparent, shielded to shielded, or transparent to transparent. And so what Zcash uses to prove that these encrypted transactions are valid is something called a ZK snark. This is a type of zero knowledge proof. It is a zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. And so zero knowledge proofs are these cryptographic protocols that make it possible to prove that a statement is true without revealing any information other than the statement. And so often you can have these um, interactive challenge response rounds, but for the purposes of a blockchain, you need something that's both short and easy to verify without needing any interactivity. And so that's um, the essence of what a ZK snark is like. And I like to think of it as a kind of hash for computation. So it's like this discrete proof that a computation was executed in the right way. And so with every shielded transaction, we include this proof, and that proves that the consensus rules um, hold for that transaction. So inputs equal to outputs, that the sender has authority to spend, all of those things constituting a valid transaction. And then in addition to this, we have this protocol with a system of commitments and nullifiers that sort of functions as an encrypted version of UTXOs to ensure the equivalence of the value flowing through this shielded ecosystem. So here's a kind of illustration of the commitment and nullifier system. Essentially, you have two Merkle trees, one for the commitments, one for the nullifiers. When a shielded note gets created, um, you create a commitment to that note. And then when you spend it, you issue a nullifier nullifying that previous commitment. Um, and Sprout is the version of our software, which is um, the one we launched with. And we're upgrading many things, including parts of this protocol in the next version called Sapling due to launch this fall. I'll get into that in a minute. So also here is a closer zoom in on what a shielded transaction looks like. So you have your inputs for, this would be like shielded inputs, and so you would um, have the nullifiers for those, and then you'd be creating your proof with uh, randomness going into the nullifier to delink it from uh, the commitment for anyone like observing or trying to triangulate. Um, you have your public key that you're authorized to spend. You include uh, the Merkle root of this commitment and then um, your fee, and then you create commitments for those new notes that you're creating and uh, commit those to the tree. And so in here, in this illustration, the red is the private value and the white is the public value. All right, so that's kind of a brief high-level overview of how Zcash works. And now I'm going to go over what we've done since launch and some of the highlights of the features. So one thing that we launched with was an encrypted memo field in all shielded transactions. So um, this is 512 bytes of arbitrary data that can go in any encrypted transaction. And people have used this for little messaging applications. Um, there's one called ZMessage, which people can use to send messages um, in these encrypted memo fields, so like a way to use the blockchain for cheap private messages. Um, and then another thing that we've added is various features to help provide 
varying levels of transaction privacy and to give users control over um, who can see what they've um, done in the shielded addresses. So one of these is payment disclosure, which generates, um, allows the sender to generate on demand assigned proof of payment with the message. And so essentially the, generate, the sender generates a hex blob and can send this to any third party. And then this independent third party can verify that the information in their shielded transaction, including the data in the memo field, was correct um, by putting it into their Zcash client. And then something else is viewing keys, which are similar to a Bitcoin watch-only address. So this lets you view funds coming into a shielded address, but not have any authority to spend. And so, for example, um, one person using this has a cold wallet and then like sees payments coming into that and can take action based on that without having the uh, security of that uh, ad like address being compromised. So another feature that we're in the process of working on but haven't released yet is payment offloading. And so right now, shielded transactions are computationally intensive to generate. So this would allow you to offload the heaviest part of that to like a remote server and then to have like a light wallet that just um, does the essential parts of that. And something else that we did last year was create a cross-chain atomic transaction tool called XCAT. Um, and this was a Python command line tool that let us do trades between Bitcoin and Zcash transparent addresses on testnet. And we didn't take it to production because at that time, lots of decentralized exchanges were springing up and we kind of just tabled that once we started and um, wanted to see what else would happen in this ecosystem as we continued to build out and focus on the Zcash protocol. So the big thing coming up for us this year is the Sapling network upgrade. It's due around fall this year. And this is going to bring a lot of efficiency improvements. So when Zcash launched, the shielded transactions took about 40 seconds to generate. Um, and it's much cheaper to verify, but the proving time was quite expensive. And so we're adding efficiency improvements, including moving to a new elliptic curve called JubJub, um, switching to a more efficient hash function, and changing the protocol a bit. And so all of these are going to give an 80% reduction in proving time and about a 98% reduction in memory usage. Um, because of these changes, um, we're also having to do a new parameter generation ceremony. So the first time Zcash Network launched, you need this shared randomness to construct proofs. So that was done at the beginning of the network launch, and um, it involved six people. It was a very secret ceremony. It wasn't announced until afterwards, and it was very well documented. But as long as one of those participants destroyed their shard of the um, private information, then the ceremony would not be compromised. Um, so this time, we're doing it with dozens of participants. We changed the multi-party computation protocol. And this one is called Powers of Tau. The Zcash Foundation is kind of coordinating it. And it's being done through this public listserv that you can find if you go to this website, Zcash slash Powers of Tau. And so any members of the public can participate. Lots of people from different organizations have done so already. And I think that wraps up around the end of this month. Something else that happened this year is the Zcash Foundation was started. So the Zcash Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit that got nonprofit status this year. It's separate from the Zcash company, and its mission is to build infrastructure for internet payments and privacy for the common good. So the foundation has, uh, is funded through donations, many through members of the Zcash company, um, other individuals, and it has been giving out grants um, the last round of grants, some of the projects that were accepted was this alternative fully validating node in Rust, improved wallets, block explorers, multi-platform support, and a web-based XCAT tool for the um, cross-chain atomic swap that I mentioned earlier. Also, I think there's a study on the empirical analysis of the Zcash blockchains graph that was funded. So there's going to be another round of foundation grants soon, if anyone's interested. And also, the foundation is organizing a conference this summer, ZCon Zero. So this conference is for people building privacy technology for the common good. It'll be in Montreal, June 25th through 28th. And you can apply to attend at z.cash.foundation slash ZCon. It's going to be a fairly small, like, academic sort of affair. That's about all. There's the resources. Uh, you can go to this website for the Zcash Foundation. Um, the Zcash community chat is where a lot of development occurs, and you can talk to any members of the team or any of the developers in the ecosystem. Um, all the code is on GitHub under Zcash, and our website is z.cash, and that has extensive documentation of the first parameter generation ceremony, the protocol, and many other resources. All right, I think we have some time for questions. That's about all. Thanks.
Uh-huh. What's the difference between that and like a P, putting a, some, like a PTP on a, like Ethereum or something? Um, because you have it, the, it's, um, the encrypted memo field is like a field in the shielded transaction. So if you send like a small shielded payment to someone, you can also send a message along with it. So you kind of like have offloaded the key management to the blockchain, which is the convenient thing about it. So for example, you can do this encrypted messaging application without managing keys yourself because you just assume that if this person has this private Zcash address, they have the key to that and they can read your messages. And so the fee to send a message would just be like, you could do the minimum 0 0.0001 Zeek or something. And then they would get your message um, by default of them having the private key. Yeah, so that's what's convenient. It also doesn't have to be encrypted. Um, you can hack your client. It's not like a consensus rule that it's encrypted. So for example, someone has also hacked their client to create an unencrypted encrypted memo field in which they use that space to compress like a tiny program that then like created ASCII art. It was like just a weird hack that someone did. So that's possible as well. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question uh, is not related with what you spoke in the in the talk, but uh, of the uses of saved cash. Uh, do you have a usable wallet? Because I try to use it, I receive payments, and although I'm a computer scientist and developer, I'm not sure I will be able to send because you have a um, console-based uh, interface, right? Yeah, there is a GUI wallet that supports shielded transactions. It's um, maintained by just uh, some developer on GitHub. Like the company doesn't support any wallets officially, but there are some out there um, that I think are fairly usable for shielded transactions. But I don't use those, so I'm sorry, I don't know the most information about them. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hi, uh, can you talk a little bit about the differences between Zcash and some of the other privacy coins out there? Yeah, so the difference is the way that the encryption works. Like, um, I deleted a slide on privacy comparisons because I'm not an expert in that, and I know that just in general, that, like, you know, Monero uses ring signatures. Um, there's this other proposal of confidential transactions. All of these, like, are different ways that you could get privacy in a blockchain, um, but those rely on, like, you know, different ways of hiding either the sender or receiver um, and... For like, for example, confidential transactions, you could hide the um, the transaction details, but not like the sender. And then like, you know, ring signatures, you could like hide the sender and stuff like that. But the difference is with um, Zcash is you encrypt the entire transaction, so only the receiver knows like who the like the details of the transaction, and then um, everything else is um, private in a way in which you wouldn't be able to do unless you had a zero knowledge proof, because otherwise like you could just be encrypting gibberish. And so the core contribution here is using the zero knowledge proof to validate encrypted data. And then that gives you, in terms of privacy properties, like a larger anonymity set because you're using the entire pool of all shielded transactions flowing through the network. And um, uh, yeah, it was like you can do things like the encrypted memo field, which is like encrypting arbitrary data. Thank you, Jay. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Jiyang Wu uh, from Fusion. Good afternoon. Uh, it's, a, it's a long weekend. Uh, I arrived in uh, uh, Boston in, uh, this Thursday, and I will leave tomorrow I, from Shanghai. It's a long journey. And uh, I'm very glad to meet you here. Uh, today I will talk about the new generation of smart contract. <clears throat> I'm a, a future, uh, I'm a co-founder of Fusion. Uh, we have raised uh, uh, fifty thousand uh, ETH in this February. I think that uh, smart contract is very important because uh, it is interacting of value. Uh, I think human civilization progresses with the progress of the technology of human uh, cooperation, cooperation. Do you agree? Uh, there is two great, uh, two, um, two methods of cooperation. Uh, one is communication, another is cooperation. 
Communication is by contact, but cooperation uh, is by contracts. So uh, there is a whole revolution of information. Uh, people are communicating now use uh, the Internet of, uh, Internet of Information. But we found that there is another movement here that is another revolution that is the Internet of Values. Uh, by using Internet of Information, we map the offline information on the line. And by using the Internet of Value, we map the off-chain value on the chain. But uh, the interval value is in its very early stage. We can find that they are, they are very different too. They have a different protocol. They have a different structure. For example, interval, value, interval information is based on the TCP IP, but the interval value is based on the UDP. They are very, very different. And also, uh, we found that there is a Digitalization in the internal information, but there is a tokenization on the internal value. Uh, and their program, programming, the method words available, their programming is very different too. Uh, we use smart contract on, their, on the uh, internal value. Uh, we use the general program programming on the internal information. We found that uh, the program on the internal value is very in its very early stage. We can we can find that uh, the smart contract there is a history. Uh, firstly, we use oral smart contract, but that's not good enough. So we use ceremony or testimony, and there is non uh, non oral uh, non paper uh, contracts and then paper contracts, and people embrace. Uh, the paper contracts. Nowadays, we think that we uh, use paper contracts all the time. I think people are in the digitalization uh, time, uh, but also we are we in the paper time because we use paper in the internet interact of values. Though we use uh, bit information. Uh, digitalized information, the internal information, all the time we use paper uh, contracts uh, in the internal value. So at the 19, uh, uh, 20, 1990s, people used uh, digitalized contracts, but that is centralized one. We use the centralized organizations through such as BACs and so on. Uh, we use this uh, organization to, uh, by them, we use technical uh, contracts. And it's not really smart contract. Smart contract is raised, the concept is raised in uh, 1970 by Nick Zabel. And then uh, there is a, a genius, maybe a team of genius, that is Satoshi, in 19, uh, 2009, uh, used the script. Uh, that is really not. Uh, then it's not Turing company, but then in 2015, uh, there is a Turing company uh, 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 smart contract. But this smart contract now people are using all days is paying for because it can be triggered by only by only by tra another transaction. Another transaction is, is done by another people. So when you, when you do not transacting. Uh, send the transaction to that contract address, that contract is dead. Uh, how this, uh, also this contract, smart contract is benign because this contract cannot visit off-chain data. Uh, so this smart contract is not what we want. Uh, we found that uh, the centralized smart contract, uh, a contract and the distributed contract, they are all still different. We use handwriting signature all the time, and then we use digital, digital uh, signature in the centralized uh, uh, cooperation, and then centralized the ledger. They are fast. They can interoperable, uh, interoperable, scannable, and usable. 
but for the uh, distribu distributed contracts, they use crypto signature. Uh, they uh, this media uh, uh, way uh, they happen in community, and they also uh, use distributed ledger. But they as they as no, uh, they they have no interoperability, scalability, and also no usability. Uh, it's painful. We can find internal value. Uh, its inter interoperability is uh, very weak uh, because we found that the blockchain is island. It's island economy. You can do anything on a single uh, blockchain, but the, these blockchains cannot interoperable with each other. It's, it's a mockery that uh, we have uh, less than 2,000 coins, but we have more than 8,000 exchanges. They are centralized exchanges. And uh, also organizations, they cannot uh, interoperate with each other. They cannot have smart contracts. And this back, that back, or uh, insurance company, any company, they don't have, they, don't, they cannot express or interoperate with each other by smart contract. And uh, this also happens data source. Uh, once data, they can interoperate with each other. Now they cannot. So the interoperability is a, has a net uh, has a bottleneck in the interoperability, and also its scalability is very painful. Uh, you can find uh, the values on the interoperability only coins or tokens. We feel that it's virtual, it's not real, because we can't find land, the house, and so on files. Maybe there are USTD, uh, USDT, and uh, maybe there are uh, warrior, but nowadays you can find that. There's so few uh, venues that's being mapped on the internal venue. So uh, this scalability is, is a problem. And also this usability is also a problem, because we can find there's a, a C, plus plus C sharp and Python and so on, but there currently we mainly use Sonality to program smart contracts. And there is, a, there is no such uh, application ecosystem and they are uh, paying for two. And uh, I think the most important uh, application on the internal value should be finance. I call this finance crypto finance because on this finance system, the values are controlled by a private keys and use this uh, technology of crypto technology. Uh, so I think this finance is, finance is crypto finance. But this finance, uh, crypto finance based on the internal value. So also have three problems, three net uh, bottleneck that interoperability can find that uh, they are not cross chain, they are not cross uh, organization, they are not cross data source. And also prog uh, programmability, that is uh, not so good because it cannot visit outside source. It, it is very slow. It cannot run a cat on the Ethereum. And its market is not so good because you don't have so many values being mapped on this uh, uh, crypto finance system. And the market depth, the market width is not so good. Uh, ecosystem of this crypto finance is not so good. You can find there is little. You can only find the payments, the currents. Everybody just as Harry can say, everybody can issue his money, but this is only payment. And but there, there is another thing that is very good that happens in 2017. That is ICO. Uh, in the beginning of 17, I think there is less than 200 uh, to uh, 20 billion U.S. dollar of the uh, of the cap, uh, market cap of whole uh, coins. Uh, in the end of 17, I think there is about uh, 70. Uh, 700, 700 billion US dollar, uh, US dollar uh, market cap uh, for the uh, corporate finance. But except these two, the tokens, the ICO, there's no insurance, no, no one, no equity, no derivatives, no CDS, ABS, anything we don't find that. So this is corporate finance. This is very urge, it's very early uh, in, the, in, in its development stage. 
So what's the problem? This problem is smart contracts. I think there need to be a next generation of smart contracts uh, to, to, uh, to address the three problems. That is interoperability. Uh, we need multi-token smart contracts. This token can have many, uh, smart contracts have many uh, tokens being expressed or programmed in one smart contract. And scalability, we need multi-triggering smart contract because we need outside data to trigger. That is mean event trigger. You, you as developers, you know that event trigger is very important. And also usability. Uh, we need smart node smart contract because nowadays a smart contract is run only on computer. Though there is maybe some of computers running, they are doing proof of work. They are not really running something. So uh, multi-token, uh, we need to BTC, ETH, uh, US dollar, warrior, house token, land token, and so on being run in a smart contract. That is smart token smart contract. And what's the much triggering? Can be triggered by transactions that is Ethereum smart contract are doing. But also we need time trigger. You know that? Time trigger is very important state of other contracts. So other contracts can trigger this smart contract. We also need off-chain data source triggering. That means event triggering. If you are running an insurance smart contract, there is a car accident. I think this car accident need a, a data triggering. And also much, no, that is parallel computing. Yeah. Uh, so what we are doing, uh, Fusion uh, is doing is to address these three problems, that is, we use distributed control rights management. What does this mean? It means that the private key is uh, every value is, uh, is controlled by private key. So we will cut this private key in, uh, hundreds, in hundreds of uh, pieces. And every node, every bookkeeping node or minor only control one piece of this uh, private key. And then we have nobody really control this private key. In this way, when you send money, send your tokens or coins to Fusion mainnet. You only send to uh, codes. You take, you move, you give the control to the codes, not really person. So in this way, uh, Fusion provides distributed control uh, rights management. So in, people can send BTC, ETH, and so on, Every, in the future, maybe other tokens, they can send in uh, central future. Uh, in this way, many, many tokens can be mapped on, can be mapped on a fusion blockchain. And then they can interact with each other in a single smart contract. And these smart contracts can interact with each other. Uh, so this is uh, distributed control uh, rights management. Use distributed nodes to control the private key. Then the private key can generates the public key, and the public key can generate the uh, address. We need to redress the cross data source problem. That is, uh, triggering mechanism can be triggered by events. So we need the calling list, need the condition being list outside of the contract. That is, a list of conditions, because you cannot know the what smart contract to check if whether you should run them, you need to list the, take out the uh, conditions out list, and manners can only check the list, that's very easy. And we also use uh, uh, a multi uh, consensus, a hybrid, hybrid consensus. That because the computer level, you, you just compute the smart contract. There is another layer, that layer is just packaging the results, that is the bookkeeping. Uh, problem. So in the computing layer, we use grouping. We group the, uh, all these uh, bookkeeping nodes so they can do different things. Different smart contracts can be in different uh, groups. And then uh, they can pack in the second level. It will be much easier. It's, this is parallel computing or sharding. So in this way, every uh, 
value can be expressed in a smart contract. We fusion, fusion as the nuclear fusion can fusion all these things in together can create what uh, financial uh, services because fusion provide complete financial functionality. Thanks. Any question? <clears throat> Yeah. When you split the key into many pieces, yeah. uh, how, do you, how do you prevent against a, like a civil attack? Uh, I, uh, since uh, we introduce randomness, and what, uh, every gro group, uh, there is, uh, uh, they are decided by their hush, and uh, they were randomly into different groups. And uh, we, uh, have many mechanisms to uh, pr uh, to protect your value. Uh, you can read the white paper because there's many hard. This is very core core technology for us. Uh, we use many mechanisms to prove the uh, the uh, the safety. Uh, in fact, the fusion is the side chain of every other chain. Yeah. You can understand that the side chain, every other chain. Thank you. I wonder to what extent verification or formal verification is, plays a role in the fusion blockchain and smart contract. Uh, can you repeat it again? Uh, <clears throat> to what extent are the is the code and the compiled bytecode? formally verified that it does what is specified in such a presentation or white paper? Uh, uh, you mean the uh, virtual machine? Uh, the, the bad code, the, uh, warp, warp, uh, the warp code? Uh, yeah, we have a, a, machi a virtual machine based on the Ethereum. Uh, we were uh, compatible with uh, uh, Ethereum smart contract. Uh, it's very similar to Ethereum as a multi-token because uh, 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 in Ethereum there is e ERC20, so it's very similar. But uh, our smart contract can visit off-chain data. That's the difference. And also there is a smart contract can operate the locking and lockout. Locking means you send outside uh, the other blockchains going into a fusion. Uh, the fusion network needs to check the, uh, that original blockchain, the conditions. Uh, th there is a lock, locking and lockout uh, operation. That is different from the uh, smart contract of Israel. Hi, uh, may I ask if fusion is based in China? Uh, it, uh, it's registered in Singapore, okay. and the, the core team is in Shanghai. I, in China, uh, I was yeah. going to ask about how um, Fusion plans to deal with um, the regulatory environment in like countries that are um, not as friendly to cryptocurrencies like China and similar. Uh, uh, again, can you speak again? Uh, how does Fusion plan to deal with a financial regulation in um, I, I think it's a public chain, and everybody can use it. When, uh, when the main, main chain uh, launched, everybody can use. We can not manage these regulations. People can use it just like Bitcoin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now we have Marco. Hey, everybody. You all made it to the end of the thing. So like in a video game, I'm the, uh, you know, the end level boss. You're welcome. <laughs> so let's see if we can make it through this. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys want to go home, so I'll, uh, I'll run through this pretty quickly. Um, let me see if I can figure it out. Hey, it worked. All right. So I'm Marco Perboom. Uh, I'm one of the uh, developers. Is it working, actually? Is the audio working? Hello. There we go. All right. I'll stand right here. So um, I'm one of the developers on the Decred project. I work on uh, new systems development, so things that are 
that don't exist and are usually made into a proof of concept first, they typically run through me. So um, I work on new stuff. I'm also the CTO of Company Zero, so that's the company that actually launched Decred. Uh, I won't get into it. Come find me afterwards if you want to know what that means. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about governance um, and why it's not boring. So those are my daughter's ferrets. And uh, so when I talk to people about governance, often that is the reaction I get is, you know, yawn. That is really, really not interesting. But uh, I'll walk you guys through some of the reasons why it is actually a pretty interesting topic and why I even believe why 2018 is going to be the year of governance. So um, what is Decred? So we are a, let me see what I wrote down here. This is an older presentation. So this is a digital autonomous currency. Um, so we exist because we saw some issues in the Bitcoin community um, surrounding governance and power structures that did not like to, you know, to be disturbed a little bit. So um, at Company Zero, we actually wrote a Bitcoin client that was fully compatible and, and it was not received as open-armed as we expected. Uh, people felt threatened by it. So there was all kinds of debates and discussions about, hey, but what if a hard fork happens? Which is kind of hilarious now in 2018, right? After seeing what happened in 2017 when hard forks is now considered even governance. So anyway, so that, but that is one of the reasons why we exist is because uh, we found that there was a lack of uh, playability, if you will, in the field for companies like uh, we were, in the, so for the software and the code that we were trying to write. So uh, what do we do? So we are self-sustained, so uh, we bootstrapped, no ICOs, none of that nonsense. Uh, we wrote all the code ourselves, we took no VC money, uh, so we bootstrapped ourselves, and there's no uh, corporate agenda here. Uh, to play by. So we have a proof of work, proof of stake hybrid. What that means is actually that uh, we incorporate uh, both proof of work and proof of stake. So proof of work we use in the traditional sense like you know in Bitcoin. And the proof of stake guys actually have veto power um, over the proof of work guys. So um, I won't go, go into much detail on that. That's an entire topic and there was even a panel discussion that I really should have been in on. Because uh, I had some opinion on that. Um, so what we actually try to do with Decred is to create a proper uh, amount of tension and proper incentives, uh, which we felt were lacking a little bit in Bitcoin. So the idea is to keep everybody happy by incentivizing proper behavior. That, that was very important in, a, in what we were trying to achieve here. So uh, we have been also in the forefront of innovation for quite a while. Uh, a lot of code originates in Decred and then makes it through the ecosystem. Uh, cross the topic swaps is one of those things that happen through us. Um, again, I, I won't uh, bother you guys too much. Let's keep going. So some of the Decred highlights, uh, so what we did recently is, um, so we did on-chain voting. That's actually, at this point, over a year old. But what that means is we have a dispute mechanism, and we can actually make hard decisions uh, that surrounding consensus and protocol. We can actually vote that in on the blockchain. So let's say, hey, we want to have a 2 meg block size, and the code would be dormant. Uh, inside the daemon and vote happens, or sorry, the, the voting happens for a period of time, and then once the votes are tallied and uh, the vote passes, then, the, then we have a controlled hard fork that is going to go down the new direction. Um, so we are going to have lightning that is actually literally days or weeks away. We are down to one bug, and it's going to basically be a, um, a it's the same code that's going to run the Bitcoin lightning, but we made uh, so we made basically a translation layer between the Bitcoin and the Decred bits. So that's about to, to drop. Um, so cross-chain uh, cross atomic swaps I was talking about earlier, we are actually the ones who maintain the repo that everybody seems to be using. Um, so if you want to uh, you know, add a coin, just you know, shoot us a PR, we will include it. So at this point we have like 15 coins in there, you know, from uh, Vert to, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin, Bcash, a bunch of those are already in there, Litecoin. Um, so in the future, so the Politeia platform, that's actually the thing I'm working on, that is all about the, uh, the governance uh, portion, so the, the signaling portion of the, the governance system, so all proposals. Um, we are almost ready with SPV, that is also another feature that we're going to add, so we can actually have a secure mobile wallet uh, without having any key material on, the, on a mobile phone. And uh, another big feature that's going to happen 
pretty soon here is we're going to actually have uh, privacy. So that's one of the features that we always had as bullet number one, but we never got to it. You know how it goes, right? Writing code, things are hard, uh, so you kind of, get, kind of you know, kick it forward. So but we found the, the right developer for this feature, and so we're also expecting to launch that uh, pretty soon here. And it's not going to be based on anything that you've seen before. Actually, like what we saw earlier with the CK Snarks and the ring signatures, we're going to do something novel. Um, and so and the next thing is we are going to try to actually give away our entire treasury fund to the Decred, Decred DAE, so the Decentralized Autonomous Entity. And the idea is then that smart contracts manage all the funds in the treasury, uh, and it will all be voted in and out by the, um, by the stakeholders. So it's no longer a human uh, doing the work. So governance, what does it mean? So it's, as I mentioned earlier a little bit, it's dispute resolution uh, and it's future proving. That is actually probably one of the most important things here. So if something needs to change on the protocol level, that is really hard currently in Bitcoin, uh, in bordering on impossible. So uh, we have that mechanism. As I described earlier, code is dormant, uh, people can vote on it, and if it passes, the, you know, it, it'll become active and therefore fork. And then if you don't like that, then you have two options. One of them is suck it up, um, and the other one is you, you, know, you pick up your marbles and you leave. We're also in addition to that fork resistance, so those really are truly your only options. Um, so, and the portion that I mentioned here at the bottom is we have censorship uh, resistant vo uh, voting, so a lot of folks have seen, especially if you use social media, there is a lot of silent censorship going on, and we wanted to make sure that the people that make proposals uh, have a recourse if they feel that they were censored. So, but we have to have a form of censorship because it is the internet, so a bunch of garbage is going to start showing up that we as a project don't want to be associated with. So there's gonna be a two-tiered system. So the one that I described earlier, that is the, uh, the on-chain consensus and protocol changes, and then there's the tier two, and that is basically a, um, um, the, uh, sorry, the, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, there's the, the community wish list. So that is, hey, can we spend some money on marketing? Can we buy some stickers? Can we buy some awesome Decred jackets that everybody wants? Um, so those are obviously not as uh, complicated and don't need as much uh, vetting that they need to go on the blockchain. So we, those things, the, the wish list can be, uh, can be voted on. It's going to be censorship resistant, as I said earlier. It's going to get ratified on the blockchain, but that data is not going to live on the blockchain. So what's we got here? So this is a bit more detail. Let me see what I wrote down here. Um, so tier one, on-chain. I actually already went through all this, so I'm just going to give you guys five seconds to read through the thing. So but it's tier one is on-chain vote. It's binding, so it's dormant code. There's no backseas. You vote, uh, it gets recorded, and at the end of the tallying, it's just going to happen. So it enables us to uh, scale into the future, and the rest I've already mentioned. So let's go to the next one. So tier two, so it's off-chain, so it, uh, it's going to be binding. Uh, so it's going to be binding on the chain, but it's, the data is kept off-chain. So it's pretty important because, you know, um, the real estate on the blockchain is pretty expensive and there's not so much of it. So you need to uh, make sure that you don't have too much of it. So in a lot of the non-technical things are going to go on there, like I mentioned before, like a marketing budget or something along those lines. All right. And with that, I can answer some questions if there's any minutes left. Oh, wrong button. Let me see if I can solve that. I just want you to kind of explain more on the tension uh, and the incentive, the two uh, balances that you said is, which is uh, lacking in Bitcoin, but you said that you have attempted to take it forward. The tension word is, is what I'm looking at. I'm not sure I follow the question, though. So you use the word tension. You created a balance between tension uh -huh. and incentive uh, design, like a carrot and a stick kind of thing. Right. So I just want to know what are the what's that tension uh, piece that you have built into Decred, which is not there in bitcoins. Sure. Um, so so the, the tension that we have is that we incentivize good behavior, right? So uh, the way we split the block reward, it's 60, 30, 10. 60% 60 goes to the, uh, to the miners because they have real hardware and real electricity bills they need to pay, so they get the majority of it. 30% goes to the stakeholders that are voting on that block. So uh, there's between three and five voters, so it's uh, the 30% divided by five gets the biggest, so everybody gets the reward. And by the way, if the, um, if the, uh, one of the tension things in here is that if you only would, as a miner, would show up with two votes, 
your block would be rejected. So you got nothing at that point. So that's bad news for them. So they tried really hard to get somewhere between three to five. And in, in order to make sure that we actually pick five, is their award is based on how many voters they got. So if they only get three, they only get three-fifths of the 60% of the reward. Does that make sense? So, and if you have four voters, you get four fifths. If you have five votes, you get five fifths. So it's in their best interest to get as many votes on the block as they can because they're going to extract maximum, uh, you know, maximum reward at that point. So, and, and that's what we did throughout the entire system is have these kinds of things put in there. So if I behave properly, I'm going to get the most amount of money. If I misbehave, I might lose my entire uh, you know, reward. And you know, miners are pretty, co pretty much coin-operated, right? So, and, and, and how are you anchoring the off-chain into the on-chain uh, transaction? You said use the for word the voting anchor. part. Yeah. Oh, so whatever the, you use, use the word anchoring. So. Oh, anchor. So it, yeah. well, the so the, there's a couple of things there. So we have a, a tool called DCR time, and that is a proof of existence tool. So you basically just grab a bunch of uh, documents, right? You shot them up, you send them in, you know, it gets, uh, every hour gets anchored into the blockchain as a single Merkle root. So then you can get with a, uh, you know, uh, with a Merkle path plus a hash, you can validate that that thing existed. We're publishing the Merkle root uh, onto the on-chain. That's right, yeah. So we have an op return plus the Merkle root, right? And then if you recall that, then you get your Merkle path with that so you can actually do the proof of existence. So that's step one. So then actually in the proposal system itself, Actually, on the very back end, is we actually use Git. So, and Git is actually a, a snapshot of a file system, if you will. So, what we do is we commit um, these proposals that they come in, right? And then all these Git commits actually get then anchored into DCR time. So, what you get is you get basically get this uh, th this movie of how the file system has changed over time, and it's all anchored. So, every if you would you know delete a commit, you would immediately be able to uh, detect that. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, and then we have a couple more tricks actually up our sleeve to, you know, to, to make that even more resilient. Oh, thanks so much. Any other questions? Oh, come on, one more. I know it's late. Oh, you want to talk about the, 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 the jacket? All right, let's talk about the jacket. So, uh, the, the deep red jacket is a thing. It's literally the hottest item in crypto right now. So, uh, and if you want to buy one, we actually partnered with uh, Crypto Emporium. Um, so, they're on Twitter. Come find me. They are selling them uh, for, you know, for, you can actually spend your decred on your Bitcoin or whatever on it. So, they're a, they are a high end uh, store. So, I, I'm shilling here a little bit, but they sell some pretty cool stuff. So, if you want to buy a Tesla a yacht or even an island in Fiji, uh, they, can, they can accommodate. And, decred jacket. Uh, I have one question. Uh, so you, can you talk a little more about the privacy part that you just mentioned? No. And if that's too early, <laughs> uh, are anybody else uh, developing the Decred client? You said that the Bitcoin community was not too welcoming. Are there multiple versions of the Decred client right now? Um, so, so let me do the first question. So the reason I cannot speak about um, privacy yet is that in the past, we've put out some ideas that then were taken by the, you know, by much more deep-pocketed corporations, and they were poorly implemented, and it actually reflected bad on us. So when we are wor working on really sensitive features, we actually tend to develop them in-house and then just drop them uh, into the community. So less sensitive things like the proposal system is completely in the open. So 99% of the stuff we do is always open, but um, but with some of these sensitive things, we just have to be a bit more careful. Um, so that, that answers one question, and the other one was, help me out, um, oh, clients, yeah. So we are actually actively hoping that somebody else is going to implement a, a Decred client. It would be wonderful, because then we can actually do some cross-verification. So uh, the way we view the world is the internet is not awesome because there is a single web browser or a single TCP IP implementation, right? It is great because there's many, and when one broke, there were many others to, you know, to keep at least the thing going. So having multiple uh, full node implementations would actually be very healthy for the ecosystem, and I would welcome people you know, to go write one in whatever your favorite language is. Anything else? Any more questions? No? All right. Thanks, everybody.